Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Sky Sports F1 podcast. Joining me for this one is Damon Hill and fresh from her weekend in Sao Paulo, Naomi Schiff. Uh, hello to both of you. Naomi, let's start with you. You were in Brazil. How was it? Hi, Matt. First of all, hi, Damon. I hope you guys are both well. Um, Brazil, I mean, look, I, I think Brazil is probably one of my top events of the season. Uh, it's always a pleasure to go back. I went last year for the first time, so this is my second attempt at the Brazilian Grand Prix. And yeah, I just love it. The crowd there are incredible and everything that they had to put up with between weather, sunshine. I'm not the most incredible racing on race day itself, but they got a great sprint race. And um, yeah, overall, I'd say pretty big tick for Brazil in terms of the atmosphere that it delivers. Big tick. Damon, you, you were watching from home, I assume. How was it for you? I enjoyed the coverage, of course. Um, always <laughs> always entertaining and informative. Um, There's some good moments, especially, of course, uh, Martin's grid walk and an interview with the, the Tommy Gun bloke, whatever his name was. Uh, he was <laughs> Machine Gun Machine Kelly. Gun, yeah. Machine Gun Ke Kelly. So, yeah, interesting, <laughs> interesting fellow. Um, so that as that was pure, obviously, uh, grid walk gold. Uh, everyone responded to that. Um, and the dancing people, uh, you know, and the lovely little chap on the ukulele. Or it's not a ukulele, is it? It's called uh, something else. It's, uh, um, it's Ted different. nailed it. They tune it. Yeah, Ted, yeah, Ted told us. I can't remember what it's called, but he, he no. absolutely nailed the pronunciation. And yeah, incredible. Yeah. So, of course, and so we watch a whole everything around the event, of course, was was fascinating. And, and as the vi if vibrancy of Brazil comes through, doesn't it? Every time you, 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 know, you can't help but be affected by the energy in the place. Um, and the track is also, the, I, st I think, one of the best racetracks we ever go to. It's, it's relatively simple, but it produces fantastic watchable racing uh, and and opportunities for drivers uh, the center s is and and the back straight is an, another overtaking opportunity including this what isn't really a main straight it's a main bend isn't it it just goes on and on and on and it's so steep uh, as well that kind of creates issues and we saw that in the race unfolding when we got to the end of the race uh, with fernando who uh, was using some clever Fernando tactics to uh, to keep uh, to keep Checker behind him, but you know that that circuit is is a great place to go racing. There was a bit of a lull between the dramatic start, the restart, and uh, watching the cat and mouse game with um, with Lando and uh, with Max. Um, but so it was a bit of a kind of bit where I thought this this race seems to be a very long race, um, and then it got interesting at the end. So I was yeah. happy. Very good summary, Damon. I was going to ask for a one-word race review, but I'm almost inclined to take that as your. <laughs> that, that was how I saw review. it. That's pretty yeah, much how yeah. you yeah. asked me. So I, I did. I did sit down and have a, a few crisps and, and maybe a beer as well. So I was watching it at home. So I was, <laughs> I was relaxing, uh, as I as I'm entitled to. Very good, uh, Naomi. I, I mean, look. Do you have a one-word race review? You said earlier you didn't, so I don't, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you yeah, for I, a word. Yeah, I feel like it's quite tough. Is there a synonym for something that? means that something starts at the peak, sort of plateaus and then peaks again at the end. If you can think of one uh, word for that, then that would be it. Could it be called the Sao Paulo Grand Prix? That's not one word, but um, <laughs> of course it's not the Brazilian, is it? We, we, so how did that happen? Why is it not the Brazilian Grand Prix? Uh, anyway, Sao Paulo have got it. They're obviously at, at war with some of the other places in <laughs> in Brazil who want, they want to claim the whole thing for themselves, not, 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 not donate it to the state, the wider state. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. It definitely had a, you know, the normal peak and then a lull, a very, very kind of long lull in the middle. Which is still a bit surprising though, because the sprint itself was quite full of action. And of, of course we had a very different grid on Sunday and that obviously potentially played into it. We lost a lot of drivers off of the grid as well. So that maybe also played into it. But um, as you said, Damon, it's one of the best racing tracks that we visit all year, especially in terms of the racing that it typically delivers. And I guess this just wasn't the year. I think last year we had a statistic of 62 overtakes, which made it the, the most overtakes of any race last season. And I don't know what the number was this time around, but it certainly didn't feel like the most overtakes of the season. What you should do is mm. ed to get the sprint and edit out the middle bit of the Grand Prix and put the sprint <laughs> in the middle of the race. And you've got an action pack race because I thought the sprint was very good. I, I liked all the darting around and everyone jostling for position and, and, and the desperation is, is much more urgency about the, the sprint uh, performances of the drivers. So mm. um, 
it, it is entertaining. Of course, it's a, it's a bone of contention now. They've, they've talked about potentially changing the format and whether or not it's some people don't like it. Um, Red Bull don't seem to like it. Max doesn't seem to like it. Um, so there's discussion about that. And fans, of course, have, have got their right to say what they think of it, um, whether they think it's a plus or a minus. I, mean, it's, uh, I know what they're trying to do, but um, it can be confusing, I think. There's, so there's, there's something to be discussed about. When, when, I get, when I just talk to people who I know who follow, you, you know, follow racing loosely, they'd go, they don't understand. They just, you, know, it's, you say to them, there's a sprint race. Well, what's a sprint race? You know, they, they, you know, we mustn't assume that everybody gets it. They, I think it, in some way it does confuse people. They understand there's a Grand Prix on Sunday. What's this other race? You know, so on a kind of broader level, it's difficult to explain to people why you're having a race the day before the race. I did actually have the opportunity to ask the question to all the drivers that were in the press conference on Thursday on what obviously last sixth and final uh, sprint race of the season, what were their, you know, reflections on the year. And I have to say it was quite mixed and I was surprised that quite a few of them, I would say probably the majority of them were pro um, the sprint. I think viewing figures show that the sprint is loved by audiences as well, because at the end of the day, even if it is confusing, and I think because there's so much in this phase of sort of experimenting with the format and it keeps slightly changing that people can't really keep up with it, at the end of the day, would you rather watch Free Practice 3 or a sprint shootout or a sprint race? Um, yeah, I think three practices is a lot. And I think this is a way to give both audiences at home and at the track something more interesting to watch. Mm. What I like, actually, to be fair as well, is at least it's a discussion. It feels like there is Stefano Domenicali is having discussions with the teams and with the drivers to, to actually establish what everyone wants. And also, I'm sure he'll take on, on board fan opinion as well. So it's not set in stone. And I think that's a very positive thing. Um, all right, let, let, let's move on. There's a, there's a couple of meaty topics I want to get into. The second one being Alonso's heroics, which was a great story and a brilliant end to the race. But But the first part the first section of the podcast i want to talk about it is mercedes and lewis hamilton finished finished eighth which is more than a minute behind max verstappen while george russell retired with an engine failure he was running in 11th and i'm just gonna run you through some of the some of the comments from toto wolf after the race because i think these are these are quite extraordinary um he said the following it is totally baffling and unacceptable an inexcusable performance this car doesn't deserve a win and then he also said it was the worst weekend in 13 years, which I think is an extraordinary thing to say. Naomi, what, what was the mood in the paddock post-race on Sunday? Well, look, um, I think we all heard Toto's words on the show. And I think Ted was the one to ask him the questions. And I think <laughs> well done to Ted for persevering with the questions because it just seemed like Toto was not in a good place. And I think those words are quite strong. And I'm not sure if it's potentially a bit of an emotional reaction to a moment after the race, uh, because overall, of course, it was not a great weekend for them. You know, they they did, they lacked pace. Um, they were obviously, you know, using up the tires a lot more than majority of the teams around them and something that's very uncharacteristic for their car. So unable to use the tires in the way they wanted to. And on top of that, they had reliability issues. So a lot of things going wrong for them. But if you look back just two races they had two podiums and two races and that car was moving forwards in a positive trajectory so I think although it was quite a dramatic result for them it, it just does seem like it may be a once-off and maybe they know more than we do and obviously they do but at the end of the day we've seen that car in the past be very as Toto described it on a knife's edge so that working window for them is very narrow and I think that given the fact it was a sprint weekend, it's possible that they led themselves in the wrong direction when it comes to setup. So I'm pretty sure that they're having major debriefs right now. But I, th I don't know if we should take Tosa's reaction with a bit of a pinch of salt. I think it was quite a pessimistic um, outlook on a weekend that, of course, didn't go the way they wanted it to at all. But is are they really in that dire of a situation right now? I think recent future, I mean, recent history, I should say, um, shows that they aren't in such a terrible place. I think Ted, Ted uh, raised some interesting questions in his in his um, TED talk and his um, not TED talk his, uh, <laughs> <laughs> notebook talk. Let's I call mean, it a TED talk. A Ted, it's, it's kind of he was there before TED, wasn't he? Really, <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, but um, yeah, so he was talking about is this the end of the era with Mike Elliott leaving? And um, you know, there are key people who have have drifted away from the team. 
are we seeing the effects? I mean, I, I agree with Nomi. This is this is a one. I mean, because in America it looked great, except they were disqualified. So you know, um, and maybe they they erred on the side of safety a little bit too much. Maybe you know these cars are incredibly fickle. The, the F stands for fickle at the moment in Formula One because. <laughs> You know, everyone's up and down. It was previous races, last two races, Aston Martin were nowhere, you know, and uh, and then suddenly they're up there looking good. I know they were helped with the qualifying a bit, but but Fernando was reasonably competitive and, and it looked uh, good for them. So um, it don't, you don't need much to be out of the window, it seems, with some of these teams' cars. Obviously, the exception is Red Bull, um, but, um, you know, they have... Maybe even they would say, I mean, Singapore caught them out, didn't it? And it was a ride height change. So these cars are very, very, it seems to me, dependent on precise setup for each particular track. And, and if you get out of the window and the competition being as tight as it is now, um, then it, you really are hammered. But um, I mean, I know Toto uh, operates a no blame culture, but he seemed to be taking all the blame for himself, didn't he? Then he seemed he seemed to, mm. willing to admit that it wasn't acceptable, but um, it's a tough weekend. And um, Lewis uh, underlined it by, you know, admitting that this is not where he thought he'd be by this time at the end of the season. But it could have been just a one off. We've got two more races to find out. But mm. Yeah. Naomi, it's, uh, just try and explain how a car goes, because it's so inconsistent. So how can Lewis go from finishing P2 in Mexico to finishing uh, in, in, in P8 in, in Brazil? Like how, how does that happen? Well, look, I think that's something that, you know, unfortunately for Mercedes, we maybe thought or thought that they'd pass that phase. Because if you look back to last season, obviously new generation car, they started the season off pretty poorly and... Every time they brought an upgrade to that car where they thought there might be a, a glimmer of hope, um, it sometimes went in the opposite direction. And I think there's been a lot of confusion with this car of when they set it up, it tends to do things that they weren't expecting. We all thought that they had passed that phase. And I think this weekend just proved again that actually it's all about that that operational window and where the car does and doesn't work. And clearly they are still very much on the fence there. And I think, you know, it's it's... It is possible with these types of cars, as Damon was pointing out, that they are just so sensitive to setup. And I think it's a good thing for them right now to have a weekend like this, because sometimes when you have too much of a positive trajectory, you start to think things are fine. And given the fact that they aren't fighting for the championship this season, obviously they're still in a title battle with them. Um, with Ferrari and they only lost two points to Ferrari this weekend, but it's good for them to recognize that actually the changes that they're making to the car for next year, I think there's there, there has been a bit of doubt on the concept perspective. Like, do they stick to this concept? Do they not? They kind of have gone in the direction that they weren't, but then when the car starts performing so positively, then they have doubts about the choice that they've made. So I think this for them is just a big learning curve. You know, it's a good weekend to take away a lot of learning. I think they've had weekends like this in the past. I think if you think back to even Singapore in 2015, they had a terrible weekend that they then had a lot of learning from and took some positive things out of that. So it's coming at the right time. And again, obviously, as I said, they, they only lost two points to Ferrari. So although it wasn't great, uh, it didn't put too much of a dent in what they're trying to achieve for this season. Mm -hmm. Damon, on that, do you think, say, say Brazil last year when George won the, the race, do you almost think, a bit like what Naomi's saying there, when, when that happens with this concept of car, that's almost a, a bad thing because it's, it's kind of going, oh, well, actually, maybe the concept isn't so bad. Perhaps if we keep going down this route, we'll get there. Whereas actually, maybe you need more weekends like they've just had to go, actually, no, 100%, this is the wrong concept next well, year in they, the redesign of this yeah. car we have to start from zero they they know it's wrong uh, they they've admitted that as much you know this season they've but they can't do anything with, with this car so you have to wait till next year that's why lewis is so um keen to, to say goodbye to this car because they can't there's only so much you can do with um a fundamental design i mean the word concept i know they don't want to use it but there are parameters within the design of this 2023 car which they can't get around until they design a completely new car. So back in the factory, they will be designing a completely new car that doesn't have any resemblance or very few resemblances to this this year's car. But they can't simply change this car, so they're stuck. They know they've been 
they'd been they went up the wrong um design route um from the beginning uh it took me a year to admit or maybe even more than a year to admit that it was wrong um they've admitted they've changed some things and they're heading back probably they believe in the right direction but they won't know until they get their hands on next year's car and that's always a bit of an anxious situation to be in um i think there's a there's a in in, in some ways you know if you've got okay it's good that you have to get the setup right it's good that the teams have work to do to provide um a competitive car it, it, it's not good when you've got one team able to just simply do whatever they like when they turn up it seems to me um and they've got such an advantage that it is it, they're probably out of the window to the same degree that say mercedes is occasionally or aston martin is but they, it doesn't affect them as much because they still have a margin to play with so um these cars are very fickle and it's i would guess mostly to do with the right height mostly to do with the close the proximity to the to the ground um if you if you take a plunger and you stick it on a window okay you try and pull it off it's if you've got a perfect seal you could you could hang off the ceiling with one of those things you know a vacuum under a car is an enormously powerful thing but unfortunately it goes up in a very very sharp rate now you could change the rate at which it goes up by increasing the ride height um and they've got a very simple cheap device for doing that and it's called the plank um which i always think is the wrong terminology for a, 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 t a sport as sophisticated as formula one to have a plank <laughs> on a on a formula one car but um it's just simply make the cars uh run a little bit higher that could that could make it less volatile for all the teams it also reduce the overall downfalls of the cars and um, make them slide around a bit more. But that be, everyone would say, well, Rebel would just say, well, that's totally unfair. We've got our car working. Why can't everyone else fix theirs? And that's a very good point that uh, that Damon brings up is is that ride height. And, you know, if you look back to Austin, obviously Lewis was on the podium. Um, so was the Ferrari. And post uh, scrutineering, they recognized that the cars were running too low. And now that's a big question mark that we've all had over the weekend is, were Mercedes playing it safe? Were they being a little bit too cautious in terms of their ride height? And did they then ultimately suffer for it? Um, they also had quite a large rear wing on the car, I guess, to compensate a little bit for that. Um, and they therefore were also super exposed, even when in DRS, uh, that car was super draggy and I just think that they just were not operating the right window from a setup perspective. Um, yeah, it just it, it didn't it didn't look great out there for them. Mm. And we know, of course, with sprint weekends, if you don't get that right in FP1, it has such a negative impact throughout. So if you look back at last year, don't forget that this race, Brazil, was the the race weekend where Red Bull offered the same opportunity to Mercedes because they got their operational window wrong because it was a sprint race weekend as well. And they just led that car in the wrong direction. And therefore, um, you know, George had the opportunity to take both wins that weekend. So it can happen that easily. And I think we've seen so many teams this season have big swings in weekends like this. Let's not forget that, you know, everyone's singing the praises of McLaren. And of course they deserve all of that because they've truly turned their situation around, but they also have had an off weekend. I mean, Monza, they were P8 and P12. So it's not very uncommon um, across the grid for these types of weekends to happen. And again, I think that's because it's a characteristic of these new generation Formula One cars that they are just, you know, limited in their window of performance. Uh, D Damon, I want to pick you up on something you said about Red Bull. And we had Nico Rosberg on the podcast a few weeks ago. And he was saying, entirely unrelated to Mercedes, he was saying to, about Checo, was saying he feels that fans perhaps look at Checo and say, well, you've let us down this year because you're in the fastest car to challenge and give us close racing, to give us battles. And I wonder if there's a sense with fans of F1, with Mercedes now, it's, you know, you are eight time constructors champions in this era of, of Formula One. You are the ones who have the the resources and the power to give us fans better racing, closer, closer races. Do, do you see a little bit of that argument? Can you see a bit of frustration amongst fans that that we don't have closer racing? That, that actually Mercedes are the ones with the power to change it. I think even I think even Dutch fans, Max fans, would want to see Max doing what he does in in battle. Uh, conditions. I, I think that uh, you know it is great to see what they've done. It's incredible what they've achieved, but we you know we love racing they love racing they 
you know, Max was out. I don't, I don't remember seeing much of Max in that in the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. He was out there going around, and I think he was asked a question by um, whoever did the interviews. I can't remember. Anyway, um, uh, afterwards, who was saying, "Well, do you have trouble concentrating with that far ahead? You know, um, is it difficult to keep your mind on the job um, when you're in front?" And he kind of, I think, he kind of admits, admitted, sort of, it, it, it is. There's still stuff to do, but, um, and Lando was keeping him honest, but, you know, you know, it's some, you get applauded. I've, I've been race, in races where I've won by a country mile and everyone says, what an amazing performance. And you, you sort of want to go, well, to be honest, it wasn't that difficult because mm. <laughs> everything went for me <laughs> right, you know, the right way. And, um, and I just had to not make a mistake. So, um, you know, the things that you remember, the things that we love about sport is the brilliant overtakes i mean <clears throat> i mean lewis on the first lap was it first lap or second lap or down the outside of um was it checo i think um and it was that was a brave brave move you know he, and those things are what we live for you know he um he, he showed his brilliance and also the, the the race with fernando we all get to the edge of our seats again so we do want it um how you get it this has always been like this before i mean i used to watch you know jackie stewart go off into the distance in the 1970s and um you know he'd, he'd go past and then you wait a minute and then someone else would go past and uh and it went on for an hour and a half or nearly two hours so um so we mustn't <laughs> mustn't get too despondent you know it is um the coverage is much better than it was back then too so you didn't even see anything except um when they went past you at the pit so anyway um yeah i think uh it, we, we, they're right to 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 say, okay, well, who's going to step up to the plate? Who is going to give us the challenge? But on the Mercedes point, my anxiety is this, which is that for a long time, Mercedes dominance really was down to their power unit. They had the best power unit for a very long time. And the aerodynamics were always slightly different to Red Bulls. And if you remember towards the end of their previous formula, regulations formula um they persisted with their relatively flat looking rake on the car whereas um red bull were absolutely huge you know that they they led the way and everyone started following red bull with this very very high rake you, it looked like a rat running along didn't it the car it had a very high back and um but mercedes stuck um uh, persistently with or doggedly with their with their other they looked like they were running a different aero concept on their car in the previous regulations and then along come a new set of regs are what i'm saying is is the mercedes aero department missing a trick here and they've lost quite a few good aero people to other teams as well um so over time naomi i i was going to ask you as well obviously with regards to what the drivers are going to be thinking here, because, I mean, Lewis, this is this is one of his quotes from, from post-race on Sunday. The Red Bull is so far away that they are probably going to be very clear for the next couple of years, which, given that Lewis has a contract for two years and, you know, is obviously getting on. I mean, Fernando will come on to Fernando Alonso in a bit. He's obviously performing at the very the, the, the top of his game. But where, 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 where do you think Lewis's head is at? Where do you think George's head is at? They must be so frustrated, mustn't they? Um... Of course, look, of course. There's no two ways about it. They're all there because they want to win. I mean, one, for Lewis to come back after Abu Dhabi 2021 and not have the tools underneath him to really fight back for that eighth world title, hugely frustrating. And then George, you know, biding his time for many, many years at Williams in a car that kind of just drove around in circles and didn't often, you know, there were some highlight moments, obviously, but to be then upgraded to this... Mercedes seat that everybody dreams of and also not having the tools to properly compete. Of course, that's hugely frustrating. And the problem is, you know, whilst they're working towards a better car, so is everybody else. And unfortunately for them, and I think that was highlighted this weekend as well, or well, that's also what helped to make this weekend look even worse than what it was, was the fact that Aston were back in the picture and everybody is working on their cars and they're all working towards something better. And that includes Red Bull. And because they started with such a strong base so early on, they can just build that momentum forward quicker than others can. But then you've got to ask yourself the question, how has a team like McLaren, who essentially from at least the power unit perspective is a customer team of Mercedes, how have they, how have they 
so dramatically been able to turn it around? How were Aston at the beginning of the season so dramatically able to turn it around? And why is a team like Mercedes still struggling? And obviously they didn't, um, you know, bite the bullets at the beginning of the year or during, you know, uh, the winter period last year to completely change their concept. And I think there are some major regrets about that because they could be much further forward today. But, you know, when you're essentially working on a mechanical base that is faulty and you're just trying to make the best of a, of a situation, it's it's not going to be great. But at the end of the day, they're a team who's won multiple world championships. They know how to build a car. I have some faith that they will be able over this winter to turn their situation around. But then again, as I say, Red Bull is so far up the road and they're doing the same thing over the winter period. So it's always going to be a question mark to see where they end up next year. And I think that's the major frustration is that no one really knows what Red Bull is cooking in their lab as well. So yeah, it's, a, it's a daunting prospect, isn't it? A faster Red Bull next year. And obviously we have to remember that this has already started, right? The designers have already been working on the 2024 car, you know, over the last few months and, and, and months before that. So it's, it, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's going to be very, very interesting to see where they all end up. And um, a good segue there. You mentioned Aston Martin. Let's let's move on to a, a very positive story, I think, in, in, this, in terms of... Of, in terms of Aston and, and Fernando Alonso, who really gave us a lot to shout about in the final few laps, well, fi final 16 laps, really, of, of that race. He, There's an amazing photo, and I'm sure most of you have seen it online, of the sort of photo finish between Sergio Perez and Fernando Alonso. Honestly, a sprinter's finish when, when you look at the distance between them and you think they've gone around so many laps around a circuit. It's truly remarkable. Um, it was, uh, for the record as well, it was five one hundredths of a second between Sergio Perez and Fernando Alonso. This was an incredible battle. Uh, Damon, uh, one of Fernando's best drives, would that be fair to say, across his whole career? I can't. I can't. <clears throat> I, I only you say they say you're as good as your last race, so yes. <laughs> so, um, but um, uh, you know, I think also the other thing is that the, the, it was only five hundredths of a second, but um, it was close. Checker was overtaking. So when you see the pictures that were taken just after the finish line, he's actually right on alongside Fernando, or he's passed him. So he was. It was incredible how it just basically. The photo was there, and then a fraction of a second later, Checo was past him. So thrilling finish, and uh, also um, wonderful to watch the skill of the guy, the thinking driver, the guy who's got everything it seems you need to have as as a racing driver. What would we be getting if we could see that that brilliance at the sharp end of Formula One on a on a weekly basis? You know, it, it is. He's definitely uh, underscored his right to be at the front of Formula One, even in his dotage, um, 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, he's lost none of his abilities, it appears. In fact, he's, he's more cunning than he ever was. Mm. Speaking of cunning, Nomi, how impressed were you by his tactics if, if, if you can sort of call it call them that his, his race craft in order to, to it, it felt so 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 close for so long just if you can just try and explain how he was able to maintain that that closeness to Perez and eventually win I was just about to say if I were to say that I was impressed by that would that be undermining the skill of Fernando and Alonso because I think that for him <laughs> is so predictable like that's what we expect of him that's what we know he's really good at he's a thinking driver he's always got his head on his shoulders and he's always thinking ahead we saw the day before a lot of people becoming victim of the efficiency of these two DRS zones. So essentially going into turn one, you get a great DRS, you know, pull, um, make the move into one. But then just after you exit three, you're into another DRS zone into four. And a lot of people were just playing, again, cat and mouse of, you know, get him into one, but I get done before turn four. So we did discuss it in our post show um, after the sprint to say, well, could you not play this more strategically and just hang back in one, get as close as you can, just make sure you get a good um, good run, good momentum through one, two and three to make sure you're in a position to get that DRS down to four. And um, that's essentially what Fernando did. And I wonder, the question I was asking myself was, could Checo have played it the other way around? Could he potentially have... Because, you know, I remember talking about our racing days as well. I remember there was one track in karting that I would always go to in Cape Town and the back straight at the end of um, at the end of the lap, there was always a really bad headwind. And obviously there's no DRS in karting, but if you duck behind a driver, it essentially <laughs> works in the same way as DRS does. And I remember that you always wanted to be second going into that last lap because if you were first, you were a sitting duck. 
Um, and so my question was sort of, could Checo have taken the risk to put himself second or not second in this case, but put himself behind Fernando in order to be able to dictate the way that that situation plays off? Because Fernando was in the stronger position by being behind going into four. Um, and he did exactly what he needed to do. And then he did, he held on for dear life until that line. And that was super enthralling to watch. We were already walking towards um, the pit lane because we needed to do our post show then. We were trying to, uh, desperately to spot a monitor so we could see what was happening. But super exciting stuff and a great way to to end a, um, a race that had been a little bit boring for a while. But um, yeah, they definitely put on a great show for us, those two. Sorry, one thing to pick you up on there. How on earth do you duck in a car? Are you like, lim- is it limbo? Are you like no, leaning no, back no, or are you no, leaning forward? No, leaning forward. <laughs> leaning, leaning back would be... You can't lean I don't lean know if that would be a great idea. No. <laughs> Plus the seat. But we, you've got no belts in casting, right? So it's very easy. You just put your head in, you know, duck behind the steering wheel. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah, and slipstream. Wow. Extraordinary. I'd like to see them do there's that in Formula One. There's a lot of ducking going. You wouldn't believe, actually, Matt, how much ducking there is going on uh, really? in motor racing. I mean, it used to be a problem with the air the airbox. So if you were a slightly tall driver, you wouldn't get enough pressure in the airbox behind you. So you'd, you'd literally go down the straight with your head as low as possible. You'd slump down into the cockpit. And uh, all these, yeah, uh, partly it's kind of... Um, psychological i think you think you're helping but uh it's uh, i can remember um <clears throat> i came from bike racing and so your head forward uh in a you know when you're racing on a bike um and I, when i went to cars um pictures of me driving you could see i'm sort of straining at the leash i'm trying to uh, straining at the, the straps i'm trying to put my head forward as far as i can get <laughs> um so uh it, it, but um you know it, it, it's it, it is great when you've got a situation where you've got the, the advantage is to the to the guy in second place because you know it's coming. You you can sit there in anticipation and say, well, he's now got to defend, and he can't change lines more than once. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So it, it it is it is good those sort of circuits. In the early days of racing, it was underpowered cars. The aerodynamics and the drag is is such a a factor in racing. How you use the the ability of the car to tow up to someone or the cart and and get past and you see it in bike racing as well all the time mm. yeah. fascinating fascinating and, and in terms of the 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 performance for fernando there and indeed damon the performance for both lance stroll he finished p5 and and lance obviously finished p3 got got on the podium that was a that was a very good weekend for a team that if you remember at the start of the weekend there was all sorts of rumors about fernando alonso would he leave was he yeah. you know had, it, was he exhausted from the project at yeah. aston what, did he not see much hope for the future there but by the end of the weekend the narrative completely changed i know how can you how can you plan for anything when it's going to be up, up and down to that degree i mean i literally had Fernando down as giving up on Aston Martin. The car was parked in the last uh, two or the previous two races. He looked dejected. And what you, you don't want a dejected um, Fernando Alonso. You know, he he doesn't like being humiliated by the performance of, of things beyond his control. Um, and and then the next, how, did he even predict, did he even predict that? I know that there was a bit of help with the qualifying, but, um, you know, but, even so, uh, tremendous opportunity for him, and what a what a bounce back. Mike Crack, I think, I think they've done. I, I think Mike Crack is very good. I think that um, that team they they seem to have the right approach to. Uh, I think he mentioned it actually in Ted's notebook. He 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 said that they were down, but they didn't start blaming each other. You know, this is a guy who's come from Ferrari, and I can I can probably say without saying something which has not been said before about Ferraris I, I think their heads go down and then it's a problem whereas the story from from Fernando was that after the bad results within Aston Martin they would they got the right approach and they they learned from what they got wrong and they come back and they've fixed it and he's happy about that now uh, that would that would definitely come from someone like Mike um at the top to to get everyone to deal with the the challenge in the right way mm. Naomi is that is that the complete opposite of what's going on at Mercedes in the sense of they really seem to understand at Aston what's what's going on with their car whether it's positive or negative and that's been the case over the last uh, three four months whereas at Mercedes it doesn't really feel like they know what's wrong with the car and they, it's very hard to fix a car that you don't know what's wrong with right um I'm not entirely sure to be honest because I'm you know 
Aston started the year incredibly strong and they were definitely the talking point of the first, you know, handful of races. We were all super excited about what this means and will we see a victory from Fernando? And there was a lot of talk about the team and a lot of positivity around it, but they definitely took step backwards as well. So how much they really understand their car as well is a little bit up in the air. You know, they did loads of development on the car, brought an update to, to Austin that they, you know, we're not expecting to perform terribly. So there they are these moments where they're having this development, they're seeing one thing in the simulations, they're seeing one thing in the wind tunnel, but then putting it on the car, it's reacting completely differently. So, you know, if that, if that's why they ended up, you know, during Park for May conditions, deciding to remove all of those upgrades from the car and going back to what they had before and that was working better. This weekend, apparently, they've taken a combination of what they've had before and some of the parts they took off in, in Austin and made a combination, and that potentially works for a different track. So it's it again goes down to what Damon was saying earlier about how specific the setup is to each circuit is what it seems like for quite a lot of the teams. And I guess it is somewhat a bit of a gamble whether you get that right or wrong. And I don't think that, although Mercedes seem to suffer from this quite regularly, and I think recently it's been better, but... They're, they aren't the only ones suffering with this issue. And although they, there's something that they aren't understanding there, I think it's quite a global issue across all the teams other than probably Red Bull. Fickle. Mm. Fickle, Fickle Formula One, as uh, to coin a Damon well, Hill phrase. I, I, getting back to your podcast. Well, point, uh, point, Matt, was, you know, do they understand what they've what done wrong? And I think with the floor, they made a good step forward when they brought a new floor in for was it Austin and it the car performed well so I think we we have seen this before with other teams where they brought an upgrade even even McLaren they brought an upgrade and it didn't work to start with and they, they kind of but they persisted and there's other things that's what I mean about fickle you know this this these these gains they're trying to get on the car and what what um, um what Nomi was saying about the correlation between the theory and the the wind tunnel and the actual performance it's very difficult to get uh, any kind of consistency of information. So they're they're working sometimes in a little bit of a of a, of a less um, uh, precise uh, area. So they they get they don't get pure information, but it takes them time. Now we were talking about Red Bull. The thing there's two ways to to crack these problems. One is you spend if you call it man hours, you can have more people. Um, double the people working for the same amount of time and you'll get there if they're working to the right uh, plan you'll get there before the other people or you can have the same amount of people uh, working for double the amount of time now Red Bull they've not had to fix problems it doesn't seem this year they've been able to focus on next year so they're already like months ahead of all the others who've been trying to get their current car to work and that's the only thing that doesn't bode well for next year is that you, if, you know, if you get asked them, Mercedes have had to find the direction first before they can start developing next year's car. And that's a, that is the, that is the million dollar question or the billion dollar question or whatever it is now in F1. Um, you know, it is whether or not they really do have a clue about what to do. And I think Lewis will be asking Toto every day, are you sure, you know, you've got this right? Because he was very forceful in saying, I don't believe in this current concept when they came in with the new regs. So anyway, this this is Formula One. The pressure is huge. Yeah. Yeah. And you alluded to it there. Billions of pounds at stake, really, with with, uh, with, with the future of this. Um, I think that concludes Brazil and the, and the two topics I want to talk about with, with Brazil. Final thing I want to get your thoughts on before we go is Vegas. We've obviously got Las Vegas next week. It's come around oh so quickly. Uh, I, I can't believe we're actually going to go racing on the strip in Las Vegas, but there we are. Um, the last time we were there was in 1981 and 1982, which was in the Caesars Palace car park. I don't know if anyone, Damon, you have any recollection of that at all, or you watched it on telly, or, or no, or I was not. But I, I wasn't actually following Formula One that closely at that in those days. Oh, really? But, but but I remember the the Clive James in Las Vegas documentary that he did was was utterly brilliant. I mean, it was. Um, it was a very it's definitely worth everyone should watch that again um, but um, it, 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 um, 
it was in a car park. It was they. America wasn't turned on to. They they just thought, who are these people? They've come from Europe. <laughs> um, we don't understand what they do. Put them in the car park. Let them have their day. <laughs> and you know, you could tell it was kind of only very few Americans, uh, North Americans, understood Formula One or wanted it there. And so it it, um, it was a backwater event. Now it's not. It is main stage. They've, they've basically taken they've bought Las Vegas and um, did you see the U2 um, concert did you see the the Bono's um, tribute or mention of F1 in the in the globe what's it called the dome the sphere the, the sphere um, they're, yeah. they're, 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 they're kind of residents there and so they Bono came on stage and said something like the words effect of well we've got to leave now because we're handing over to formula one and so he went around the band and gave names to all the members of the band as as racing drivers and he he declared himself to be danny ricardo um and uh and he gave all the all the band different names for formula one drivers so um yeah they um it, las vegas will be um will be f1 next weekend is it next weekend no this, this, uh, next week yes yes next this, weekend ne not this next weekend weekends. coming the weekend after yeah um, i dare say the tickets are going to be cheaper than they were perhaps in the car park in caesar's palace i i, th I think they're going to be slightly more expensive i think uh, it, it, it's just uh, about three week. pounds fifty for an hour's parking yeah. i think in those days <laughs> <laughs> yeah no me you you went to the launch didn't you which i guess was about a year ago is that is, is that right exactly what, what a year you, ago what are you expecting from las vegas this this time around well, so I firstly won't be there, which I'm very sad about because it seems like Las Vegas, although it is the penultimate race of the season, is uh, something we've been talking about all year long. It's obviously very exciting for the sport. It's um, something that's been built up quite a lot. There's a lot going into it. Uh, I hear that if you're there as a spectator, it's going to be incredible. There are obviously no support series racing, so it's just the F1 sessions. And therefore, they have plenty of um, entertainment planned for around the event. So I think it's going to be a fantastic one to attend. Obviously, these types of races always have their growing pains when it's the first time around. There's always stuff to learn, and especially with the challenge of shutting down the strip and all of that. Um, but I do definitely think it's going to be one that's going to throw a spanner in the works because statistically, it's looking like it might be the coldest race in the history of F1. Um, I know everyone thinks, okay, in Las Vegas, Nevada, the desert must be hot. Well, it is during the day, but it's not at night. And um, qualifying will be at midnight local time. Um, the race, I think, is 10 p.m. local time, something to that extent. And uh, from what I remember last year is that it was very cold. So I think they're looking at temperatures of around five to eight degrees, um, which is going to be very cold. Street track. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely yeah. I'm it's going to be laughing. It's going to be funny like, watching everyone with puffer jackets and woolly hats and uh, you know yeah. in the in the pit lane exactly. and stuff. They, they won't need and the they're... drivers won't need those ice jackets they wear before they get in the car. That's for sure. They'll put hot water in them instead. Yes, be, yeah. Replace it with hot yeah. water bottles. Will be the order of the day. <laughs> <laughs> we can get Lando and get him, snuggle him, give him his teddy and his <laughs> hot water bottle, put him in his car. No, but, just joking. But you, no, yeah. um, by the sounds of things, they have been allocated more soft tires. I think it's probably because of that reason. And um, yeah, I think it's probably coming at the right time because. We need something to spice things up. Um, Max has obviously sealed uh, the driver's title. Red Bull have clinched the constructor's title races ago. So what's left? There's obviously the battle with Mercedes and Ferrari for the constructors and others. Um, there's still a battle between Lewis and Fernando for third in the drivers. Um, obviously, there's still the battle with um, Lewis and Checo. I don't know if that's out of touch now. I think it's 36 points between the two of them now. So I don't know if that's just on the limit, but um, a lot of, yeah, exciting things still to come. And I think Vegas is definitely gonna, I don't know if it's gonna make exciting racing. Obviously we've never raced on this track before, but I think all the factors around it are gonna make for, I think a bit of um, things being thrown up in the air a little bit. So yes, it's a new track for everyone, um, sort of an equal playing field. Mm. Damon, if you were asked back in the day, if you were asked, Damon, you, you've got to you've got to race, or you've got to be you've got to go to your quali session now. It's midnight. Mm. Do, you, do you not think that? How are the drivers going to deal with that? It's it's a completely skewed. I mean, not just the drivers, the whole team. It's it's so skewed into the evening, which no one is used to in in Formula One. 
I think they used to jet lag anyway, aren't they? I mean, they they seem to be. Like, I can remember the biggest problem for racing when I was doing it was jet lag when you go to places like Japan. But of course, you're going west, so you're not you're missing your bedtime. And they've already been in, been out there in in the US anyway, in Mexico, and uh, so they're on they're on that that time scale. But um, they'll find a way. Don't worry. The, they've got they've got <laughs> experts dealing with all this and they will yeah. be getting they'll be getting up late at least they'll be going oh well I don't have to get up till uh, you know about 12 o'clock midday or something so they'll be right mm. it's but going back going is... back sorry uh, no me exactly. it's going yeah. back the other way that's the that's gonna really Abu Dhabi God knows what we're gonna end up with in Abu Dhabi we've got a lot of a lot of sleepy drivers and uh, exactly and mechanics and people I think it works out to be 13 hours when you go from Vegas to Abu Dhabi, that's a 13 hour time adjustment. So that's going to be very interesting. But they get paid for it. So no sympathy. Yep. No sympathy <laughs> here. Um, on that on that note, uh, we will leave it there. Uh, Damon, Naomi, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for listening at home. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday. Bye for now.